I V M. It's been a journey in which the industry and the regulator have evolved together, and ultimately, if you if you look at the beginning, it was the Wild West. You know, uh, I mean, you had mutual funds which had monthly income pa- plans which had guaranteed <laughs> guaranteed income. So it income, was yeah. there was nothing defined because there was no regulator, right? Mm-hmm. So that K shape needs to narrow. Then that's the hope. But I- overall headline numbers seem t- seem to be okay. And if that can uh, if that happens, then I think India will continue to be the fastest growing large economy in the world yeah. uh, with a good differential with China also now. Uh, and and money should come in. FII money should continue to flow in. Yeah. If you look at the market cap. It's seventy thirty, nice seventy normal uh, thirty uh, higher growth uh, segments. Within the seventy, which is uh, normal growth, seventy percent typically would be large cap. Oh, okay, That's okay, a nice way to look at it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, within the thirty, which is thirty uh, percent market cap, which is in the higher growth segments, yeah. within the thirty, only thirty percent would be thirty or thirty forty percent would be large cap. Oh, okay. Folks, welcome to Besa Besa. I'm your host Anubhav Gupta, B50 on Twitter, and on today's episode, I'm talking about markets and economy outlook. My guest, Meet Vora, CIO Trust Mutual Fund. We'll be talking about all of this and some ideas for you to manage your mutual fund investments. Meet, welcome to Besa Besa. Thank you so much for doing this for the listeners. I've always wanted you on the show. Always a pleasure to be on the show. And it's great to have Trust Mutual Fund back. We had Sandeep, I think, a couple of years ago. At that point of time, of course, Trust was very different. Today, it's different. So let's start from there. Um, the Trust Group and the Trust Mutual Fund, what's the philosophy? Let's start from there. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Always a pleasure. Uh, so as you... See, most of the capital market participant, uh, p- uh, participants know about the Trust Group, but it's not a retail brand, yeah. you know. Uh, but uh, Trust Group is sponsored by, you know, Utpal Seth and Nipa Seth. Nipa Seth runs Trust Capital, which is the leading uh, fixed income house in the country. And uh, Utpal Seth is CEO of Rare Enterprises, again, a veteran in equity research, fund management, and stock picking. Yeah. Uh, is partners with uh, the Rare Family Office for many, many years now. So I think we have a good DNA of investing across asset classes as a group. And uh, we believe that we have some something unique to offer as far as the mutual fund space is concerned. Yeah. So let's talk about the philosophy of of the mutual fund um, in debt, in equity, or just generally how you look at investments. Sure. So at heart, we are growth investors, but we also are very focused on valuations. And by valuations, we don't mean value; we mean actual valuations. And what we have seen is that you know people typically tend to overestimate the short term in growth markets. But they tend to horribly underestimate the long term. Okay, so that's the co- crux of our philosophy. You know, because everybody can project for the next two to three years. You have consensus estimates, Bloomberg estimates, and there are you know growth rates. But what happens beyond five years, seven years, ten years is what actually determines the long term valuation of the company. Uh-huh. And we we have seen time and again that people capture a good amount of the upside, but the stupendous upside is missed out by not being able to. Value the stock, uh, you know, inherent, uh, you know, strengths for the long term, and that's where we believe we have some very differentiated insights with which we can pick those winners. Yeah, w- what are your products like now? Have you got the entire suite? I mean, f- uh, in debt and in equity, what are your schemes like right now? Uh, the first product we'll launch uh, probably around April uh, will be a flexi cap fund, followed by the usual, you know, other small cap, mid cap, etc. Okay, and your debt product, I, I think, is pretty much. complete absolutely we have all the entire suite of debt products uh, from a overnight fund liquid fund uh, to a short term fund to a corporate bond fund banking and psu fund so yeah. on fixed income we are pretty much you know uh, there across the spectrum sure. our first equity fund will come in april yeah so folks we'll talk about everything on the other side of not this break but a break that's coming up soon okay meet you've been in the industry for 30 plus years um, and that's valuable experience for you to share with our listen how has the mutual fund industry in evolved in this 30 years because it's look it looks like you know always that in the last 5 years the pace of change is crazy but if you look at it in a broader perspective i'm using your logic again here but in a slightly looking back let's forget the short term and let's look at the longer term the mutual funds in india i have have been around for quite some time so in your tenure in this industry how has the product I- evolved oh i mean it's been an amazing journey for the industry you know and i can pretty much say that I've been part of the entire growth of the private sector mutual fund industry. Uh, so in the in the late 80s, early 90s, the government decided to open up the mutual yeah. fund space to the private sector. That's when the entire bunch of foreign houses came in. But before that, 
the first thing that they did was to allow the public sector banks to set up mutual funds. So you had SBI mutual fund. Uh, so uh, first of all, it was only UTI to start with, right? And yeah. it, that was not bank sponsored. It was a it was a mutual fund, but not under a really you know any under uh, under any regulation, so yeah. to say. So then you had SBI. So then you had, had SBI, Canbank, Inbank, Can Bank, In yeah. Bank, Boy, the works, you know, uh, wow. and and all of them in the late 80s, early 90s uh, scaled up their uh, businesses. Some of them got foreign partners also in due course. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that you know it's been a it's been a journey of learning, and uh, it's been a journey in which the industry and the regulator have evolved together, and uh, ultimately, if you if you look at the beginning, it was the Wild West. You know, uh, I mean, you had mutual funds which had monthly income pa plans which had guaranteed <laughs> guaranteed income. So it income, was, yeah. there was nothing different because there was no regulator, right? Yeah. So people could, and, and it was launched by some public sector banks, so it was perceived to be safe. Uh, so you had mutual funds giving guaranteed, uh, uh, you know, uh, returns. So it was a complete uh, wild west. I uh, guess they were competing with something like an LIC. Absolutely. L LIC, you had quote-unquote guaranteed returns. Absolutely. So you, had, you had to offer something so for it, the... It was a very well-defined space, right? Whether you could guarantee, you should give guarantees, whether the NAVs should be daily, weekly, monthly. You used to have monthly NAVs, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so oh in God. UTI days, uh, uh, UTI 64 used to have monthly NAVs and people used to speculate on the on the NAV and pay on, play on the yeah. valuation differences, etc. Uh, so it was, it was you, know, you know, to start with very rudimentary. Yeah. But of course, the regulators and the industry have le learned together. The, the biggest uh, constraint for us, people like us who were starting off uh, into the markets, especially in the mutual, is that we had very few mentors. Mm. Because there was no breed of fund managers who could actually say that we have 20 years of uh, fund management experience in mutual funds in India because there were no mutual there funds. Were no mutual there were no there, professional yeah. money managers. Earlier, all the money management or whatever, advice, etc., whatever you call it, used to be through brokers. Yeah. And brokers yeah. were not very well respected <laughs> at that point in time, you know. <laughs> uh, so we pretty much had to learn on the go. Yeah. And, you know, uh, research reports were not available. Uh, the first bunch of research reports probably started coming in the early 90s yeah. from the local houses. Then the foreign houses came in and came up with those shiny research reports. So yeah. it was you know, really a good learning curve. So where we are right now, you know, how do you see the mutual fund industry evolving going forward? We are at 50 lakh crores of AUMs. Um, I think the coverage of stocks or even the debt market has now become very, very sorted as compared to what it was 30 years ago. Absolutely. So I think what I want to ask you is from the investor's perspective, how do you see this industry evolving? Um, do you think it's fully penetrated like jisko kharidna tha, jisko lena tha, mutual fund abhi sabke paas hai, ki or there's still room to grow first. And second is as a percentage of our overall savings, where are mutual funds right now and do you see any growth out there? So quantity as in number of investors and depth which is each investor adding more to his mutual fund investment let's talk about that so as far as the potential is concerned i think we have barely you know scratched the surface uh, while we do have a lot of sips being added every month if you if you look at the next 10 years the demographic part we are expecting the middle class and the upper upper class to go by 2 to 3 times right in the next 10 to 15 years yeah. So that's the kind of uh, explosion in investors that I see, frankly speaking. So AUM wise, I think if you compare us with the US, we are nowhere close to AUM as a percentage of the market cap, AUM as a percentage of GDP. We are like, uh, there's no point even talking about those numbers. I think it's going to, be, going to be a function of increasing prosperity, increasing financialization. And that trend I think can drive the industry at at least 15% CAGR. Because if you're talking about nominal GDP growing at 11%, mm. I don't see any reason why the mutual fund industry can't continue to grow at about 15% CAGR. That's the kind of growth that, that I see for the industry. And within the industry, there are a lot of small players that have come up, I think, in the last... I should not use the word small players, sorry, new players in Correct. the last four or five years. I think it's happened after a very long gap. For the longest time, you had the top five, and then you had the next five, and then you had probably the next ten. Absolutely. But I believe in the last couple of years, including yourself, I've had, I think, Manu... Mahindra Manu's come on the show, a lot of other, uh, NJ for for example, an entire window has opened for new mutual funds to come in. Correct. So where do you see this going? I mean, do you think that the top five will still be the top five? Do you think there's room for a new player to increase their share and move forward? I mean, and also, you know, where is the room? Is performance the only thing or are investors becoming more smart? Uh, see, before I kind of uh, uh, address that, I also want to just finish the, uh, you know, the picture sure, on so the other please. side, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the industry growth. Yeah. So I think there is, first of all, enough scope for passives, for, 
or or you can say structured products so that's one area where we have seen globally it's been a barbell right on one hand the the extremely good guys with good performance are growing yeah. and the other side you have the passives with low fees uh, growing exp- exponentially so i think it's becoming a bit of a barbell you have performance and then uh, low cost on, on one side so i think that can continue uh, etfs with uh, non human intervention like formula driven thematic etfs smart beta whatever, smart beta, yeah. whatever you call it that that i think is one area that can continue to grow so i think number of players wise there is enough scope for you know 140 crore population yeah. and uh, 40 mutual funds there is scope for you know differentiation there is scope for new players to uh, uh, to come in uh so so coming to your you know th- uh, question on on performance i think uh, as we, as we were talking about the history earlier the awareness and availability of information was also not that great so you need you needed somebody to guide you uh but now again everything is available at the click of a button there are websites there are apps you can sort and screen and analyze uh, you know fund performance styles etc uh, very very easily now and not only has the investor grown more sophisticated the advisors have also up their up their skills yeah. so i think what is necessary now is more and more uh, clarity of your strategy so what what we call ourselves we are you know we are credible we are we are consistent and we are clear a uh, clear consistent and credible that approach i think is going to work you you need to be sharply defined and that's what i think the the newer players are carving out a niche for themselves in you know okay. they have differentiated strategies whether you like it or not but it's different sure. you know, so you can pick and choose sure. and all i'm saying is that 50 lakh crores is the um size of the industry uh, about 27 lakh is equity component out of that if we grow at 15% cagr in the long term in the next 5 years this 27 lakh will probably grow to 50 lakh crores so if you if you look at the size of the industry it now sustains it's now come to such a size that even if a new player is able to garner a small fraction of 1% he's still economically viable hmm. even after fees you know sure. so 1% of 50 lakh crores is still 50000 crores half percent is 25000 yeah. crores you know yeah. so if a if a if a new player is able to make a differentiation either in terms of performance or philosophy or whatever it's there is enough in the in the you know market to uh, to feed off okay a few things that i picked up from your answer was that obviously sips sips are where they are there's enough room for um, a lot of mutual funds to grow and the retail investor is also becoming smarter and smarter but i want to understand from your perspective that are they taking better decisions right because i think one change that you would also agree in today's day and age is that and you said that also that investors have a fa- have far more information with them nilesh shop kota i think recently tweeted that the gap between an institutional investor knowledge and a retail investor knowledge has somehow you know thanks to a lot of this has Correct. come down i was i mean that is a significant achievement but are retail investors really taking better decisions today i'm also asking because you know i i did i really like your feed on linkedin and on twitter where you put in a lot of data marked with a lot of interesting thought provoking stuff so i want your take on that are we taking better decisions today sure so i would say the the investors uh, who are regularly putting in money into sips or or even ulips for that matter because that's a half yearly or you can you can essentially it's a regular committed disciplined uh, approach to investment yeah. those are investors who are really thinking longer term i would say so there there i think the journey of wealth creation is far far more visible and stable i would say for those investors but then you also have this bunch of investors which i think is is more than uh, the, than the other other uh, who are opening you know trading accounts uh, uh, speculating in options uh, day trading etc and that's increased exponentially you know the kind of option volumes that we are seeing has increased exponentially there i think we are trading on thin ice uh, because even you know sebi has come out with the data saying that 90 95% of investors not investors traders, traders. <laughs> lose money right in the fndo segment yeah. but people still come yeah. uh, so that that's that segment i'm a bit worried about i would say yeah so when you have conversations with retail investors maybe your friends family wherever you go how do they perceive mutual funds like has that change because i have a lot of conversations going on right now see traditionally the way mutual funds retail investors would look at was just performance that's it jo chalta hai usko khareedne ka that's it Correct. 
And I think um, I had, I think Rahul Goel, who was the CEO of Equity Master, saying that a lot of SIP money has gone into small and mid-cap funds also, which could be considered hot money. Now, it's one thing for traders to sit in front of a screen and do whatever they want, you know, 95% lose money, okay. But do you think that for retail investors in mutual funds, their behavior is, maybe there are some gaps, or maybe you would want to tell them that this is a different way or a better way to look at mutual funds rather than just performance? Uh I would say look at the clarity of communication and clarity of processes because sometimes there is a lot of gap between the the cup and the lip. So if your fund manager has promised you a certain style of investment, just keep a tab of whether that fund manager is sticking to that style. There is no one style which you can say is going to be the best style at all points in time. Mm. There are different styles, different approaches that work at different points in time. So either you study those styles and take a call depending on your comfort or whether you are vibing with that style or not, uh, uh, or you leave it to a fund manager or your wealth advisor to take a call for you. Sure. You know, but taking a call just based on the last three months or six months of one year of performance because now problem is all websites <laughs> allow you to sort performance so easily exactly. <laughs> across any time frame oh, you know. that it's the the. The, the instinct or the dopamine kick is to just select the top performing Always one. Always chase performance. Right? Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. the chasing performance. So that is something which can be a bit dangerous. Well, now let's get to the part of this episode where we talk about markets, economy, equity, debt and all that. So I want to start with the economy. Voter account was recently out and the elections are due, I think, in a couple of months. So what's your view on how the economy is doing and a general outlook going forward? Uh, so my view is positive and uh, yesterday in the MPC Monetary Poli uh, Policy Committee uh, statement also the RBI has projected a 7% GDP growth rate for FY25 which on top of a 7.3 uh, for FY24 is a, is a good good growth rate. You know, So government seems to be uh, on the front foot I would say. Uh, they seem to be confident about uh, growth and the budget uh, also uh, showed the same. You know, They are there was I, mean, I had some uh, expectation that there'll be some kind of populism in the budget because it's an election year mm -hmm. but there is absolutely uh, no uh, let up on the fiscal discipline i was frankly expecting a fiscal deficit target of 5.4 or 5.5 but they like blew it out of the window and yeah. they were targeted 5.1 straight away so that's very aggressive i would say which means that they are expecting good tax collections and that can ha happen only if there is good nominal gdp uh, growth rate they're expecting about 10 and a half i would say uh, so it's i think government seems to be confident about uh, growth uh, and we also should be uh, accordingly confident uh, about growth uh, the couple of places where i would expect uh, things to pick up more than what they are is on private sector capex while there are some indications that they, it's picking up, it's not as strong as one would have liked. Uh, uh, also on the rural side, I would say there is a bit of a sluggishness even 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 now. So that's one one space that I would look at. But otherwise, all the government links capex spending uh, areas are are doing very well. Uh, I think the PLI scheme rollout, while the effects are not yet visible, uh, should be felt in the next uh, one or two years. So that that should kickstart some more manufacturing uh, as far as India is concerned. And uh, I think on the on the urban side, the K-shape continues. So the high-end consumption <laughs> continues, I think, whether yeah. it's in you know real estate or, or durables. or We are seeing consistently good demand on the higher end. Mm -hmm. So that K-shape needs to narrow, then that's the hope. But the overall headline numbers seem, seem to be okay. And if that, con if that happens, then I think India will continue to be the fastest growing large economy in the world. Uh, with a good differential with China also now, uh, and and money should come in. FI money should continue to flow in. Yeah, and you've got two billion a month coming from SIPs. Uh, SIPs, and this uh, this year we, we should see even uh, bond money, uh, international oh, yeah. bond money uh, come in because we are getting included in the uh, global bond indices from June onwards. Okay, stock markets now because I want to keep the discussion separate on equity, and then we'll come to debt also. The point that you just raised was actually quite important. We'll get into that when we talk about debt. But stock markets, Mir, um. Eight years of positive growth. Okay, maybe some was maybe one or two percent, but eight years this market has just gone up, gone up, Un and unprecedented, unprecedented. Yeah, um, not not happened before. I think the previous record was probably somewhere in the nineties. Yes, and of course you remember the two thousand three to two thousand eight era where things heated up. But here we are. Um, we've had these ten, twelve percent corrections in the last. I think post March twenty twenty when you had the big collapse, and now we're looking forward. Economy is looking good. 
<laughs> I read an article today calling it the Goldilocks phase. And we remember that from the 2003 era also. So tell us what's your view on earnings and liquidity, the two most important factors on which this market is dependent. Correct. So as far as earnings is concerned, uh, if we if we achieves that 7% GDP growth expected, earnings should grow at about uh, 13 to 15% at least minimum. That's my that's my expectations. And uh, this is quite visible because if you look at the big chunks like IT, I think, uh, and uh, f financials, they alone account for a large chunk of the earnings and the earnings are not that uh, cyclical, they are yeah, quite visible, yeah, so to yeah. say. So I think there's a good confidence in 13 to 15% uh, earnings growth. As far as liquidity is concerned, you not only have SIPs, which you which you mentioned, and they are. I mean, we saw the number today. It's I think eighteen thousand crores uh, yeah, SIP yeah. SIP last month. It's only increasing uh, steadily, so that should continue. But one should also not forget that there is uh, ULIP money coming in. Uh, not only ULIP, but insurance money coming into the market. There is EPFO money coming into the market. There is NPS money coming into the market, and AIFs and PMS is also money coming yeah, into the market. Yeah. So there is a lot of lot of uh, liquidity uh, coming or in the sidelines that is that is there. And the difference versus say 10 years ago or 15 years ago is that this is now long-term committed money. So there is very little cyclicality about these components. It's getting deducted from a salary, NPS, EPF, SIPs are again committed, ULIPs uh, and insurance premiums also committed. So they are committed flows, long-term yeah. committed flows, uh, sticky. Uh, and now they have, they have become uh, of such a size that they are almost more than FI flows. Yeah. So earlier, if FI is to sell or buy, there was no counterparty. Uh, the, there was no domestic counterparty. Yeah. But yeah. now the, the local counterparties are actually becoming stronger than the FI. So to that extent, the volatility in the market has reduced quite a lot. Yeah. And we are no longer, you know, I mean, in the when we, uh, we talked about the beginning of the mutual fund industry, uh, in the 90s, we all used to envy countries like Korea and Taiwan mm. because because we used to interact with these global brokers and they said, why are you worried about FIIs? In Korea and Taiwan, they don't even look at what FIIs are doing <laughs> on a daily basis, you know? And there, and every, in India, for years and years, we're conditioned to look at the FII number at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. But that's changed now, that's changed now. Very interesting, I mean, so the domestic pool is actually deeper than just SIPs, like you just mentioned. There's SIP and then there's insurance. Within insurance, you've got NPS, you've got ULIPS, you've got pension. Not and sure. then, of course, you've got PFO money coming PFO in, money which is in. like like it's almost on tap. So I think one feature of this market, I think probably of this generation, is that they hopefully will not see what we used to see before. Like on, on any given day, the market is up 3%, down 5%. They don't care. Stocks are just wild. And they used to be curb trading and used to be all that. Absolutely. Now, I think the good part is that it's become relatively more stable as compared to the part, uh, to the past. And the new generation is far more confident. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so they don't care about uh, FI buying and selling. Even in, even in life, you see, you know, the, the newer generation is uh, is quite okay with changing jobs. Yeah. They are quite okay with even doing gigs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we would have never considered gig as an option, right? Yeah, because obviously. it's too risky for us. But the new generation doesn't care. So probably that's reflected in the stock market behavior of the new generation yeah. also. I hope it's not in reflected <laughs> in the investment. <laughs> Don't do these gigs in your investment, in at least be committed to the longer term. But what's also happened is that within sectors, within asset classes, let's say small and mid cap, there's been massive variations, right? And I remember in 2003, 2008, the CapEx cycle had taken its own shape. So CapEx and real, real estate were the hottest sectors to be in and consumers would just languish here right. and there. And the performance used to be wild. I mean, Correct. you had to be in the right place at the right time for you to... Um, now, of course, you can hide behind index funds. But as an Correct. investor, you hide behind in, an index. So you'll know that you might not get the best, the best and the worst. You'll at least get index returns, okay? Or that's what it's supposed to perform. But what's your view on this variance, right? I, in two ways. One, I want to talk about small and mid caps. Because sure. I think they've been on a tear in this last, um, I think, one year or two years. And large caps have just been left behind. Absolutely. And then we'll get to the sectoral part. But let's start with small and mid versus large. Okay. Sure. Uh, so if I look at the investable universe, I'd say there are about 1,000 stocks in India, uh, which are, say, in the NSE 500. Or there is some institutional holding. So let's say about 900 to 1,000 stocks. The, the reason why small and mid caps is such an exciting space is that if you break up the high growth segments in the economy, subsectors, high growth subsectors, for example, for me, 
say defense is a high growth sector railway capex is a high growth sector tnd maybe a high growth sector pharmaceutical now i think is going to be high growth sector so if you break up the entire market into high growth sectors and normal sectors so to say the number of stocks is about half and half hmm okay hmm. so say 4500 of normal st- growth stocks and 4500 of s- f- higher growth uh, sure, sectors sure. so that's in the number of stocks if you look at the market cap it's 70 30 nice 70 normal uh, 30 uh, higher growth uh, segments within the 70 which is uh, normal growth 70% typically would be large cap oh okay that's okay. a nice way to look at it yeah okay yeah within the 30 which is 30% uh, market cap which is in the higher growth segments yeah. within the 30 only 30% would be 30 or 30, 40% would be large cap oh okay you know so if you're looking at the emerging segments or the higher growth segments you have more opportunities in the mid and small cap space that's how the market cap and number of stocks is distributed uh-huh. so that's the reason why you know mid and small cap space continues to be a exciting space and we have seen that if the economy grows at 7% that's real nominal gdp grows at 11% that's nominal the corporate top line probably would grow at 12 13% that's the you know uh, organized sector for you and the higher growth segments would grow at 15% plus mm. so if you're looking at that, that segment then you get a lot of options in the mid and small cap uh, space what also happens is that there are always a few sectors which lead the growth correct and those will be growing at 25 and 30% and we've seen that time and again yeah. when, when new sectors emerge there's a long period of high growth uh, before it tapers off yeah. so that's where the space become exciting the reason why some of the stocks are a bit worrying is that there's a lot of froth in low liquid uh, low low floating stock uh, small caps which has happened in the last few uh, months or few quarters yeah. i would say uh, there is the micro cap segment there is the sme segment and then there are certain stocks especially in the psu space which, which have probably only 5 10% floating stock yeah so the pricing there will be wild I mean, yeah, the, the so price th- th- and just, yeah. again given the pace of uh, trading that is happening and the number of investors out there who are tra- day trading it the the movements are disproportionate yeah. so that's there is some froth in uh, these segments i would be very careful about not ignoring valuations not ignoring the quality there are a lot of unscrupulous guys out there and typically when the market does so well for so long there will be unscrupulous peers who will enter the market so we need to filter for that and hopefully the regulators also doing a good job and you know pre- preventing any problems but when there are so many ipos yeah. happening uh-huh. both on the normal board and the sme board yeah. the regulator can't have the bandwidth to track all that ultimately yeah. it's caveat emptor yeah. the investor has to do his own job yeah. so <laughs> folks that's an imp- important message for you enough opportunities out there in the market in the bigger market also but when you go smaller and more micro please be very careful of where you put your money mean before i get into favorite sectors i want to just sneak in this thing on since you mentioned about philosophy of the fund manager okay and large caps so what's happened and that's quite evident um it also occupies a lot of conversations these days is there's this big chunk of companies established very you know very high pedigree earnings growth is quite good but they've gone nowhere okay and there's a fairly large bracket out there and maybe say 10 years ago a lot of fund managers would be expounding that philosophy that right? buy high quality and p it doesn't matter and stuff and stuff like that and now you've landed in a situation where some of those stocks haven't gone anywhere for 2 years now as an investor you can still hold them i mean there's nothing fundamentally wrong thankfully mm-hmm. but when you see the 80% of the market running away and this segment which is still where it is i mean how should a retail investor align himself with this kind of a situation i don't think you see this very often that high quality is just where it is now what do i do with my portfolio but it it happens uh, all the time right so if you uh, we talked about the boom of the 2003 2008, 2008 yeah. right so at that time if you look at fmg stocks they didn't do much oh, they were nowhere they, they were, were horrible ex- yeah, yeah exactly yeah, so really it, it, it always happens people uh, the market when it goes in one direction everybody's attention is focused on one segment and uh, obviously there'll be outperformers and underperformers in uh, because of that so i think it's normal uh, what we need to understand is the stocks which have underperformed for for so long Uh, they had been probably overbid in terms of valuations sure, sure. right so in a lot of these cases what had happened is if you look at the i think they started outperforming from 2011 12 onwards right and there was a period of 
from 11, 12 to almost uh, 18, uh, 2018, yeah. where they really outperformed. But if you then break up the earnings part of it, my guess is that about 70% of the market cap addition or 60 to 70% of the market cap addition would have come from valuation re-rating. Oh, PE expansion. PE expansion. Yeah, and not so much from earnings. Not, not, not so much from earnings. Well, that has to reverse also. So that, some point that is time yeah. correcting, okay. I would say. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, now let's get into my favorite part, sectors. And you mentioned quite a few. You mentioned pharma, you mentioned TND, you mentioned defense. So let's just get a laundry list of the sectors that are looking good to you. Sure. So sector-wise, I, before I talk about sectors, uh, the broad thesis that I'm working with uh, for the next few years is that India versus the rest of the world, India growth will be superior. So India will continue to grow at a rate uh, which is faster than the developed markets and most other emerging markets. So the first preference is to look at domestic sectors rather than international sectors. So international sectors, I mean, you know, commodities, energy, uh, IT, for example, anything which depends on global cyclicality, I would prefer less. Of course, there'll be stock specific options, sure, but in sure. general, it's prefer less compared to domestic facing sectors. Within domestics, uh, my thesis is that if we are to look at this 7 plus percent GDP growth rate for the, not for the next one year, but for the next many years, uh, which we need to, if we need to go to a five, and five trillion dollar economy, etc., and raise the yep. GDP per capita, then it cannot come from consumption alone. It has to come from physical asset creation, whether it's in manufacturing, infrastructure, real estate, across the board. Uh, government uh, services, buildings, etc. It has to come from physical asset creation. So that's where my preference is. You know, uh, uh, all the segments which help in manufacturing for Atmanirbhata, manufacturing for exports, and the infrastructure that needs to support that massive scale-up in economy, mm -hmm. and real estate, which I think has been a laggard for quite some time in terms mm -hmm. of volume growth. So these are the segments which we are talking about. Now, within infra, there are so many sub-sectors which the government is extra focused on, defense, uh, railway, TND, you know, those are the segments where the government itself is spending a lot of money and creating positive policy action. But apart from that also, they are encouraging private sector in, in segments like electronic manufacturing, PL, uh, uh, textiles, mm -hmm. wi now white goods, semiconductors, renewables. So there are a lot of themes and sub-themes within physical asset creation that I'm positive on. But certainly, it cannot be, the GDP growth cannot be only consumption driven. Consumption growth can probably drive your GDP at 5 to 5.5%. Five mm. The rest has to come from physical asset creation. Yeah. Banking, I mean... I was Banking supports everything. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, was, I was just like... I was I was trying to understand the stock, stock market's expectations on the banking sector based purely on performance. I just had a look at the PSU versus private chart. My God, it's like... It is... It's like a... It's, it's like a dream call for a fund manager who got it right. And obviously, not so pleasant for someone who got it wrong. Correct. What's happening there? Uh, so banking always has this, uh, you know, uh, catch-up phase. But if I look at the very long term, tip the 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 performance of banking and financials has typically been 1.3 times the the Nifty. Correct. And that's because credit growth tends to be 1.3, 1.4 times oh, the GDP, nominal yeah. GDP growth rate. Yeah. So that equation cannot change. Okay. Now, there'll be cycles of NPAs and, and all that, yeah, ups yeah. and downs. But if you look at the long-term trend, banking has actually outperformed the Nifty more or less over a longer period of time. Okay. And before I go into debt, I want to ask one question that I usually tend to ask all fund managers when they come here is, and it's, it's, a, it's a question that comes a lot from the retail investors part. I mean, there is this over, now it's taken for granted that active will, active cannot perform, outperform passive, okay? I want your view on this. Like, what would you tell a retail investor what should be his active versus passive strategy in mutual funds? You know, equity or debt? Equity, equity. Equity, equity. okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I would say, you know, there is a space for both. Uh, so if you, if you don't really want to do too much of pick and choose and just want exposure to the asset class, then you go for, uh, you know, passive funds. But my view is that for growth markets like India, where there are so many sectors which are still underdeveloped, there will be large amount of, uh, you know, uh, or large periods of time where a few sectors and subsectors outperform for a long period of time. Yeah. We are not a mature market. Yeah. We are an emerging market. We are literally an emerging market, right? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. there will be emerging sectors in our economy which are not even existent at this point in time. I mean, you won't believe in 1990, there was no banking in the sensex. Correct. Yeah. There was no SBI which was, you know, there in the sense. So, yeah. and uh, there was no telecom, 
there was no, there was no it we used to have the centuries and premier yeah. autos at that <laughs> there was no time. it yeah. there was no it yeah. uh, they, they were all steel and automobiles uh, some pharma and fmcg companies in the index yeah. and some manufacturing companies like boltas etc but there was no banks banks there was Imagine. no telecom there was yeah. no it uh, so you know the the churn in the sectors and the segments is is huge yeah. and uh, and if we if we continue to grow and then we have to you know uh, evolve yeah. and new segments will emerge and i hope that uh this two data point that i just saw uh, sorry uh, just to come this sorry yes. and the problem is that new segments enter the index only after they have come to a performed. critical size after yeah. they have performed yeah, 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 so yeah. the large cap indices uh, may if you follow just the passive large cap index you mm. may miss out on the emerging sectors so just have an ac- active versus passive strategy don't think it's one or the other, or the other exactly you need to have both in your portfolio i was just having a look at the s&p 500 somebody put out a statistic that the top 7 have basically accounted for almost all the performance exactly now what in, in index fund will give you that kind of thing exactly and japan after 34 years 34 years is back at a new high i mean uh, so just assuming that an index is going to take care of all your needs i think that needs to change a little bit absolutely okay now let's get to the more exciting part because i i always feel the debt markets are something that uh, people don't probably understand or if they do they don't they don't know how to allocate it within their whole Correct. asset portfolio the entire <laughs> conversation about stocks 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 nobody talks about debt so two things in the debt market one is the very important point that you mentioned in the first half of this show is the foreign money coming in is something that we've not seen i think for Correct. probably ever and what's your view overall on um debt sure uh, so on debt i'm actually quite positive and if you if you if i put in the debt versus equity you know uh, debate say two or three years ago it was clearly equities right because it was undervalued and you know there was uh, turn around and you know there was a lot of stimulus so it was equities all the time now what has happened is equities has reached a certain level and there are f- certain pockets of uh, you know froth and hmm. we are talking about valuations which are above average so we not we can't say that the returns that we have seen in the last 2 3 years are going to be repeated for the next 2 3 years it's difficult to say that now there'll be decent returns but not the kind of returns that you've seen in the recent past so that's on equities on debt is the other way around we are probably at the peak of the interest rate cycle uh, most central banks are likely to start easing if not next quarter then the quarter yeah. after next yeah. uh, which means that duration should do well so we in india we are talking about the 10 year bond yield at say 7.10 my guess is that in the next 2 years we should see 6 6 and a half at some point in time wow. uh, so if you are a long duration portfolio hmm. you you can make 7.1 plus the capital appreciation so i think in the next 2 years uh, if you are uh, in a long duration portfolio you can probably make 8% per plus uh, over the next couple of years okay between duration and credit risk what do you think is you know how 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 would you play that credit risk i would leave it to to more sophisticated investors uh, to you know in investors who, who who can understand the portfolio otherwise for uh, for the lay person i don't think credit risk funds make too much sense okay so if i'm looking at starting my debt port my debt port my debt portfolio today what should i be looking at i mean how how should i allocate my money if i'm looking at maybe 10 year plus kind of investment for 10 year plus kind of investment i think you can look at a normal corporate bond fund okay uh, kind of a, which which basically is benchmarked to one of the uh, large uh, crisil benchmarks or one of those benchmarks uh, if it's a 2 3 year money then probably you would look at a short term fund sure. again there you get some upside of the duration but not that much yeah. but otherwise a normal bond fund should do well for the longer term uh, what about passive and debt markets i think that that has vanished or is it still there uh, passive in debt markets uh, is not that i mean you have the fmp equivalents uh, or or you can say target maturity funds yeah. uh, but not not too many funds were tracking a particular bond index sure okay i think we are done with our show meer our my final standard question to all our guests is what book are you reading or any content recommendations you have for our listeners oh books uh, i like to read biographies so okay. the latest one of course is elon musk's it's a thick wow. book i've just started uh, uh, yeah what by sxn uh, it's a thick book i've just started reading it my god okay uh, and uh, the first few pages itself are quite intense uh, quite intense yes okay. <laughs> so that that that's going to take you some time to yes. go through i mean ha- have you read his previous biography the one on steve jobs or yes yes yeah? absolutely absolutely lovely So folks that is it that is a wrap on this episode of Pesa Pesa my guest me Vora CIO Trust Mutual Fund 
Meer, first of all, all the best for the equity product. Really looking forward to it. And come back on our show to tell us how that is going. And second, thank you so much for doing this for our listeners. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. Thank you. I V M.